British immunologist David Miles joins the Plutopia podcast this time as we discuss vaccines and vax deniers. In his new book, David explores the history of vaccines and maps that history to today's vaccine reality. Back in the 1930s, most vaccines were done by, um, you know, were done in universities or the or actually a lot of them were done in the Institute Pasteur specifically at that point. And th at the same time, there was this sort of artisanal vaccine development thing going on where people who had an outbreak in their general area would try and culture the whatever microbe was causing it and then kill it and then inject it as a vaccine. I mean, fundamentally, that's how vaccines work. You, you take the microbe that causes the disease, you do something to it so it can't cause the disease, but it can trigger the immune memory to it. And then you give it back to give it to people and if it works, it protects them. Um, most people doing this really didn't have a clue what they were doing and probably a lot of them probably did more harm than good. Hey everybody, welcome to yet another episode of the Plutopia podcast. And we are very happy to be with you today with uh, my partner Scoop Sweeney and I'm John Lebkowski and our co-host uh, Wendy Grossman is with us and we have David Miles, who is a London-based infectious disease immunologist, and he's the author of a book called How Vaccines Work. And I'm wondering how vaccines work. Well, that that's kind of your cue, David. Um, I, yeah. don't know where you, I don't know where you want to start. Uh, but maybe start by talking about how you came to write the book, because it's a nice little story. Um, I think it, it started because I found I was just, when people found out what I was doing, they were constantly asking me these questions about, um, about vaccines and how they work. And I mean, one of, one of the, um, first one, one of the, the one that really, I think set me on the path was when I went to my GP surgery, um, because I had to get my MMR vaccine done again, because I'd recently had a stem cell transplant, which is a whole other story. Uh, and the nurse started asking me questions about um, her, uh, I think it was her son, about who had been refused, told that he couldn't have a yellow fever vaccine before he went to um, South America because he'd recently had a stem cell transplant. And then I realized, well, if I'm being asked questions about vaccines by the person who is giving me a vaccine, um, there's obviously quite a lot of stuff that's just not known and stuff that a lot of people would probably like to know. Um, so I wrote a book about it, <laughs> is yeah, the short I mean, version. What I, what I like about the book is, is that, you know, you're, you're, you're telling people stuff they don't know. And I think, you know, pro, on, as you say, I'm on the, on the side of people who are in favor of vaccines, there's, there's a lot of ignorance, but there's a lot of ignorance on the other side as well. And, you know, the people who are sort of sit, sitting on the fence and don't know who to believe, uh, you know, it gives them factual knowledge on which they can make a better decision. Yes, I hope so. Um, I mean, I, I became quite aware a lot of the public discussion about vaccine is dominated basically by people shouting at each other. Um, and a lot of the people who are, um, I don't like the word pro-vaccine because it makes it sound like an ideology. I mean, people who support vaccines do it because there's good evidence that vac the vaccines that we use are a good idea rather than that they think that, everything about vaccines is wonderful. But yeah, the people who are supporting the current vaccine schedule, for example, um, do tend to be stuck in debunk mode a lot of the time, which means that the discussions being led by the anti-vaxxers, um, then of course you never really win an argument when you're um, being led by the other side, but also it just leaves a lot of people stuck in the middle who just don't know who to believe. Uh, which is why I thought there was probably a space for a book that, as Wendy says, lays out what vaccines are, how they work. And I mean, a lot of it actually is the history of the vaccines. I think it, it's as much a book about the history of a branch of medicine as anything else. Uh, well, some, because some, some of your stories are amazing, you know, because um, as you, you know, you, you, your, your book is also kind of the history of medical ethics. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I, I actually had did actually write a whole chapter on the history of medical ethics, but we had to take it out because the book was too long already. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but you know, that, you so. had you had doctors yeah. testing vaccines on themselves or their neighbors' yeah. children or 
you know, or giving it to people with very, you know, really not very much support. And I can see where somebody, you know, the kind of misinformation that gets disseminated by somebody who's really against the whole idea, um, you know, they probably think stuff like that still happens. And when they when they talked about the COVID vaccines, that was how they talked about it. Well, it hasn't had enough testing. It's a new vaccine. Yeah. It, we, we should regard it with great suspicion. But actually, the technologies behind it were had been in development a long time. Yes. I mean, I think the, there definitely was an issue about the, um, well, a lot of the time when I was reading about, reading, doing the research behind this, about the historical development of vaccines and medicines generally. I mean, a number of times I sort of had to read something twice. I thought, they did what? <laughs> <laughs> which, which, a lot of this stuff would be thankfully unthinkable now um which um yeah I and mean, i think the, the issues around the covid vaccine the development of the covid vaccine is actually a separate issue because as you say there was a lot of um development of the covid vaccine well vaccines plural i should say that came along before was done before covid did and it was built it was that final really what they did after covid came along was that final step mm. Uh, I'm not sure which, which direction you want to take the conversation. Well, you know, I mean, I was I was really blindsided by the whole anti-vax thing, you know, because mm -hmm. people of our age, I mean, all all three of us, I mean, I don't know about, I think you're a little bit younger, David, but all three of us remember things like swimming pools being closed when we were children mm -hmm. because people were afraid of polio. And, you know, the notion that you would, you know, and we, we all had, we all went through school watching kids kids get measles and mumps and and i mean i never had either of those but maybe maybe you you pro you guys probably did uh and the notion that people want to sort of go back to a time when kids had all these things is, is just mystifying to me and you know what wasn't there a news story that what 23 kids died of whooping cough in britain this year uh, it's not 23, it's nine so far. Oh, okay. Uh, but, well, last time I checked it, it was nine, which is which is more than usual. I mean, last time it was in double figures was in 2012. Um, and it's usually been low single figures. And we've had a lot of years with nobody dying of whooping cough since then. So halfway through the year, nine kids died of whooping cough. That's not good. No. Um, that's definitely an outbreak going on. Um but you had quite a you had you had quite a good uh, you you've often used the story of whooping cough to uh, to illustrate the book. It's a thread that runs through it because um, well I, I find the the story of how it was the original whooping cough vaccine was developed very interesting because um, at the time this is back in the nineteen thirties most vaccines were done by um, you know were done in universities or the or actually a lot of them were done in the Institute Pasteur specifically at that point. And th at the same time, there was this sort of artisanal vaccine development thing going on where people who had an outbreak in their general area would try and culture the whatever microbe was causing it and then kill it and then inject it as a vaccine. I mean, fundamentally, that's how vaccines work. You, you take the microbe that causes the disease, you do something to it so it can't cause the disease, but it can trigger the immune memory to it. And then you give it back to give it to people and if it works, it protects them. Um, most people doing this really didn't have a clue what they were doing, and probably a lot of them probably did more harm than good. But there was a woman called Pearl Kendrick who was actually running the um, Michigan State Department um, lab in Grand Rapids in Michigan, decided to have a go at that with whooping cough. And her approach was just incredibly, I mean, she just finished doctorate in bacteriology at Johns Hopkins. So she, she was much better at this than a lot of people uh, who were doing it. But she was completely meticulous about this process, far more so than a lot of the much better funded researchers at the time. Um, and she came up with a way of make, of well, killing the whooping cough, but also turning it, the bacterium, but turning it into a vaccine that did protect children against whooping cough. And this is a time when whooping cough infected pretty much every child who was not in a very isolated community and usually killed about one in 50 of them. Um, and that gives you a sense that we're talking about probably very close to one in 50 of all children who were born were dying of whooping cough in this era and probably had been for several hundred years before that at least. 
so when Kendrick came out with this vaccine against whooping cough, this really was a game changer. Um, and this, again, this was before the days when these things were patented. Um, she published her instruction manual, if you like, for how to make turn whooping cough into a vaccine that anybody could use. So it was widely used initially across America and much more widely across the world after that. Um, it was the first vaccine to be proved by a double double blind placebo controlled trial. <laughs> we can talk about more later when um, that was done in Britain, actually in the 1950s, um, when that technique was coming into play. But then there was a whooping cough vaccine scare in the 70s when a man called John Wilson went on television uh, in Britain again. Um, we do seem to be where vaccine scares start over here and then we export them to America. So I apologize for that. Um, but John Wilson went on television and he said the whooping cough vaccine was damaging children and causing epilepsy and, um, and learning disabilities. And that really was the beginning of the modern anti-vaccine movement. Um, it, there was not really a popular movement against vaccines before that. But when he said that, suddenly you had people, well, I think Barbara Lowe Fisher in America was, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, uh, was one of the leading um, proponents there. She was a consumer activist more than anything else and um, quite an effective one in a lot of ways. Well, we have a, a, a locally sourced vaccine, a couple of vaccine deniers that are in the midst of a, of a presidential uh, campaign. And mm -hmm. just recently, they... Uh, uh, there was a, a leak of a a tape of a conversation between Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Donald Trump. Yes. And, I saw uh, yes. Let, let, me, let me read you what uh, Donald Trump said to Bobby. He said, when you feed a baby, Bobby, a vaccination that is like 38 different vaccines and it looks like it's meant for a horse, not a, you know, 10 pound or 20 pound baby. He said uh, that was Trump talking. He suggested that babies can change radically. Does that make any sense to you at all? Well, first of all, if he's talking about a vaccine that looks like it's for a horse, I think he, he's thinking of a Tom and Jerry cartoon, not actual vaccines that are given in a clinic. <laughs> I mean, OK, that is a man who's never taken his own children to get vaccinated. But um, I think is one thing we can take away from that. Um, there, there has been some concern about children getting too many vaccines that can possibly damage them. There has been research into that, and it's shown that, um, well, we're way short of whatever that level is, because, I mean, what matters when we're talking about a vaccine and how much we're giving to the child's immune system is how many antigens, effectively different types of protein molecule that can induce a, re a response. And mm -hmm. most vaccines, that's just, that's, single figures of protein molecule. Um, whereas when a child is breathing in, and bear in mind, every time you take a breath, you're getting a barrage of protein molecules that's coming into your mouth and your nose at that point that your immune system has to sort through. A baby is being introduced to the microbes that, well, that baby will live with for the rest of that baby's life. And a single bacterium has anything from about 2,000 to 10,000 antigens that the immune system has to process and decide what to do with. And again, that's before you count all the pollen grains and everything else that we're breathing in, the hair and everything else we're breathing on all the time. I mean, even a six in one vaccine with uh, what is about a hundred odd antigens in there, it doesn't even register on the scale of the different number of antigens that the baby's having to take in. Well, this raises a question. Um, just kind of disregarding the mythology of the anti-vaxxers, what are the actual potential adverse events that can be associated with vaccines? Um, well, the fundamental issue is that when you do get a vaccination, you are triggering the immune response. That's what it's supposed to do. Um, and well, we all know what it feels like when you trigger the immune response, because that's what happens when we get a cold, you know, that you've got to, this generalized inflammation that can go absolutely everywhere. Actually, it's pretty similar to the physiology of a hangover. Uh, it's been established lately that- um, Is a hangover is, actually an immune response? It's an inflammatory, there is an element of inflammatory response. I, mean, I, I know that there, alcohol yes. is a poison, so. It's some of the um, metabolic products of alcohol can trigger and 
a generalized inflammatory response, which is when you're feeling a bit ill because you've had a vaccine, it's basically the same thing. Um, it might be triggering inflammation in slightly different parts of the body. So the only thing we have, so all we have to do to sell vaccines is tell people that, that, that we can get them drunk first? Um, it's not the bits that get you drunk that causes the inflammation, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, but I mean, there, there are some, yeah, it can make you feel pretty ill. Um, there is a case for what's called vaccine injury, uh, which is cases where you can, there are supposedly situations where vaccines can cause serious problems. It's very, very unclear whether these things are down to the vaccine. The problem is they're very rare. Uh, so a lot of the time it's, and because the vaccine, well, particularly in the US and the UK, there are compensation systems for people who have vaccine injuries, but they are designed to treat them to set a fairly low burden of evidence for somebody who's claiming to be vaccine injured, because it's basically impossible to say if you if some if you, somebody's had a vaccine and then something happens, well, did the vaccine cause it or did something else cause it? It's very difficult to say. I mean, I'll tell you one story. I got this from um, a pediatric neurologist. This is actually someone who had the same job as John Wilson. They look at neurological conditions in children. Um, one of the children he saw in his clinic, well, the child arrived in his clinic because the child had epilepsy. But the story of the child's first epileptic seizure was his mother had taken him for a routine vaccination at the local GP surgery. The surgery was running a bit late. So she thought, well, rather than wait in the surgery, she went around, to, around the corner to a cafe to have a coffee and just wait in there. And while she was sitting in the cafe drinking her coffee, the child had his first um, epileptic seizure which ended up with a child going and seeing uh, in the clinic of the person who told me about it. But the, the point is, if that clinic, vaccine clinic had been running on time, the child would just have been vaccinated when he had that seizure. And the, the child's mother and quite probably the nurse who'd given the vaccine would have been convinced the vaccine caused the seizure. Now, a lot of children get vaccines and actually not many children have epileptic seizures, but they've got to have the first seizure sometime. So there's going to be cases where that happens. Yeah. But how do you tell whether or not the vaccine caused the seizure? Yeah, um, correlation versus causation. Well, especially when there's very little data. Um, no, I mean, there have been cases where specific vaccines have been linked to serious adverse events. Uh, and I don't want to deny that at all um there was the i think in the 90s there was a vaccine against rotavirus that had to be withdrawn in america because it was causing a condition called intersusception where the um the, the child's intestine effectively rolls into itself which didn't kill any children but it was serious enough and of course there was the oxford astrazeneca covid vaccine did cause serious problems with blood clots in a very small number of people blood I mean, clots yeah yeah Weren't there, weren't there issues with uh, thimerosal used as a preservative in vaccines? Oh, that story. <laughs> um, no. I mean, is that correct that that was the case? No. What happened um, was, now I'm going to have to get my agencies right here, because uh, what happened was the, um, um, it was the FDA realized that the tamirosol in the vaccines was exceeding the limits set by the EPA for uh, mercury. Um, and they withdrew it at that point. And it was only after it was withdrawn that there was an argument about the tamirosol came up. Now, there's a couple of issues there. First of all, um, the um, EPA regulations are set on a different compound of mercury that's actually a lot more toxic than tamirosol. Um, but it was enough to cause enough of a review that they decided it was worth withdrawing it because the point of the tamirosol is to, it's a preservative, it stops any bacteria growing in the vaccine, but they decided actually this wasn't really a problem. Uh, by this time, most of the vaccines being given out what's called single dose, effectively one vial, one vaccine, or they just give you the syringe and it's all in there. There's no real opportunity for it to get contaminated. And you can't, a lot of the vaccines are also involve live viruses like the MMR vaccine, and you can't put tamirosol in that anyway, because it'll just kill the vaccine. So there was relatively little of it being used. So the, um, it wasn't really that, the FDA decided it wasn't worth bothering with. They just removed it rather than worry about whether it was causing a problem or not. There was never any evidence it was actually causing a problem. 
but somehow or another this got seized on um, in ways that made very, very little sense. And th there's a lot of evidence from countries that um, had already withdrawn to Marisol that um, well, it was it was linked to autism, and there was there is an issue of rising autism, or was an issue of rising autism, which we can talk about separately. But actually, there's quite good data from Denmark, which had never which had not been using smirosol vaccines for years, and they'd have had rising autism rates as well. Um, but as I say, it got seized on. I mean, to the extent that a lot of the rhetoric from the anti-vaxxers was saying that it was tamirosol in the MMR vaccine that was causing autism. In fact, the MMR vaccine has never had tamirosol in it and cannot have tamirosol in it because it would inactivate the vaccine in that because of the way that particular vaccine works. Um, it, it, I think what it was was somebody seized on the fact that the FDA picked up that issue and then it somehow got tied in with the argument that was already going on about vaccines causing autism in ways that frankly never made a lot of sense. There are arguments that, um, you know, people have argued that the mRNA vaccine is like really new and untested and uh, can potentially cause, what, what are some of the weird stories? I think they've talked about that it could affect your DNA. And of course we know that those are incorrect, but how is mRNA different from traditional vaccines and, and how long has it been around? Um, well, how long has mRNA been around? probably for as long as life's been around well i mean <laughs> the vac the vaccines yeah. based on mrna yeah um well the, the yeah i i just as a slight aside before i go to the bulk of the question where, when they started rolling out the um cowpox vaccine against smallpox in um 19th century britain it was william hogarth the cartoonist started drawing pictures of people getting the vaccines with cows heads on them because obviously this vaccine from a cow was going to put a cow's heads on them then when we start hearing that the mRNA vaccine is going to change DNA, it's basically the same thing. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, to answer your question, um, mRNA is, well, it is the molecule that codes for proteins in any living thing. Um, and the proteins can, may or may not be the antigens that the immune system responds to. Um, that's been known for a long time. The, the problem actually with mRNA, the idea was always, well, if we put mRNA into a cell and it produces the antigens in the cell, and then the cell does what cells do when they've got weird antigens in them and it effectively presents, it hijacks them, presents them on the surface and activates the immune system. Well, what you're actually doing there is replicating a viral infection because that's what viruses do. Um, but you're doing it with only one, only the one or two genes or whatever it is that you want the antigens for instead of the virus, which is taking the whole machinery of the virus with it. Um, now, if, I mean, it, it, is, it is slightly odd to say you're better off getting SARS-CoV-2 than an mRNA vaccine because inserting a, a RNA into your cell is exactly what SARS-CoV-2 does and like actually what a lot of viruses do. Um, the development process actually went on mostly, I mean, I think it's not really, it's, it's been a bit more widely recognized now than it originally was. It was done mostly at the um, University of Pennsylvania uh, by um, Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman were developing it for about 30 years. Um, Carrico actually got started trying to come up with a way of, where people had liver, had liver defect in the liver where they weren't producing certain enzymes, you know, insert the mRNA into somebody's liver cell that will replicate the, the natural process um later on started working on vaccines the difficult bit actually was getting the rna into the cell because the immune system is pretty good at like, if, if it, it picks up rna floating around it'll knock it out pretty quickly um which is why viruses have to be as complicated as they are um so a lot of it was developing the delivery mechanism which is a lipid capsule that it uses um they were working on, now let me think, I think the first vaccine they came up with was, I don't know if you remember back in 2017, there was a major outbreak of Zika virus in, mostly in South America, but also in, yeah. Um, and they produced a vaccine against that, um, which took, and were able to get something up and ready for trials within a matter of months, which is, un, I mean, if you look at how long most vaccines up to that point are taken. The process of getting to that stage have been taken years. 
Um, as it happened, the outbreak had passed by the time it was ready for trials, so it never left the lab. But it did mean that by 2017, they had a uh, uh, technology looking for an application, if you like. And actually, at the same time, this was working, they were at the, um, particularly the Oxford group was doing exactly the same thing, developing uh, viral vectors. Effectively, it is using a virus that you can then insert a gene into. Uh, so you had these two, what they call platform technologies. Um, that is a technology that you can insert that was ready for an application. You didn't have to start the development process from scratch. Um, they were ready really within the few years before uh, COVID came along in, well, December 2019, the last days of December of 2019, in fact. Um, so they were applications ready, looking for, an, well, they were technologies looking for an application at that point. Um, and again, because of some other thing, because the, um, the sequence, the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 was made available with very, very quickly, a matter of weeks after it first appeared. Um, they were able to take um, genes from it and put it into these vaccines. In fact, um, another aside was uh, a few weeks back, I was giving this talk, well, not this, sorry, not this talk, giving a talk at a uh, science festival. I was on stage with Kath Green, who um, co-invented the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And I was my role, if you like, was a sort of the warm up act because she was the superstar. They were all there to see. Um, and, and so I was mentioning that uh, and my role was to describe the, the early history of vaccines. And I mentioned one of the early vaccines was made by a man called Valdemar Hafkin against bubonic plague in India. And I deliberately set it up. So I said, well, it's often described as being an extraordinarily short process to develop a vaccine because he did it in three months. And then Kath took the stage and she said, we did it in 67 days, um, which was quite extraordinary. And I mean, I think that, that that is a significant point that the fact that they had the vaccine developed within 67 days, I mean, they had a working vaccine by April, 2020. Um, right, but, then it, but then it took then it took quite some months to what, test it and get, figure out how to distribute it and so forth. Is that, because yeah. I, yeah. I didn't get mine until November and I think I was in the second or third group. Was it November? I don't remember it being ready till the January, February, 2021. I might be wrong. It, um, seems, it, seems, it seems to me. The, I'm first sure that group, was, the first group was people over 85 or something and, and clinically vulnerable. And maybe I think it was in like the third group. Was it? I don't think it, I would have to check. I do yeah, not have I, It's hard to remember now exactly yeah. the dates. I, I thought it was. I thought it was yeah. before the end of 2020, but yeah. my, 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 my point really is, that, is, I think, to speak to what uh, John was saying about these vaccines being rushed out, that actually the, the vaccine was there from um, fairly early in 2020. And the fact that it wasn't rolled out then was because it was being tested. Um, and, yeah, and it sounds like they've been working on that type of vaccine for a long time and it just had to be adapted. But, but I, I, another question I have is we sort of came to think from getting, you know, the polio vaccine and all the vaccines we got when we were kids that a vaccine would wipe, would prevent you from getting the illness. But with flu and with COVID in both, yeah. in both of those cases with those viruses, uh, you can get the vaccine and you still get sick. Um, is is that really the, is the case with most vaccines that that there's always a chance that you'll still get sick well i mean there's every, okay there's multiple sides to that i mean first of all there's always going to be cases where the vaccine just doesn't work in a particular individual for some re one reason or another um i mean no vaccine is a hundred works a hundred percent successfully in every individual um some vaccines do work a lot more frequently and a lot more reliably than others. Um, and um, and some microbes are just more prone to, to being dealt with with vaccines. I may always use measles as an example of a, uh, an extremely effective vaccine. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the measles virus is very stable. Um, the measles virus that the vaccines that we're doing, we're using at the moment are most of them are derived from a, vac a measles virus that was isolated back in 1947-ish, something like that, 
which is still substantively the same as the measles that are in circulation now, which is why we can still use the same vaccine. Um, influenza, COVID, they just evolve very, very quickly, um, which is, to some extent, it's the evolution of the virus. Um, if a virus like influenza is able to keep coming back and infecting people who are immune to influenza as it were, was last year, may not be completely immune to influenza as it is this year. The other problem is the immunology of the upper respiratory tract um, is it's it's very complicated because it is this problem that we're just breathing in antigens with every breath we take and we don't want our immune system to go absolutely crazy at all of them because we would feel like we've got stinking cold all the time. Um, it does seem like it's quite um, it's, it's an area that's quite easy to infect and quite hard to have an immune response against and it's not only the evolution of the virus. I mean, there was a study done a few years back where they took um, healthy young people and did what's called a challenge study where they deliberately infect them with influenza. And, um, you know, they got a bit of a cold and they were fine. Um, and then a year later, they infected the same seven of the same people with the same influenza virus. And they put it, this was not, it hadn't, they'd stuck it in the freezer, so it hadn't had a chance to evolve. It was exactly the same virus and five of them got a cold again. Um, so, you know, even the natural infection with exactly the same virus hadn't given long lasting protection. It is usually quite good at, the immunology of the upper respiratory tract is, is usually quite good at containing the virus or the infection within the upper respiratory tract, which is where we want it. I mean, where we start having problems with these infections is when they get down into the lungs or, um, or into the bloodstream or well some of the bacteria that start in the upper respiratory tract then get out and go they're the reason we get meningitis but they actually infect through the upper respiratory tract and then find their way into the bloodstream and, in, and then into the meninges i recently read a uh, report from uh, reuters about uh, mm -hmm. members of the european uh, parliament have uh, been criti criticizing the European Commission for a lack of transparency in all of the contracts they uh, uh, implemented with all the makers of the uh, COVID vaccines. And uh, have you followed that at all? I mean, it, it, it seems like the transparency is very important in a, something like the COVID vaccine. Yeah, I haven't been following that case in detail. I mean, I'm aware there's been a lot of argument in, and it's not just in the, um, within Europe about how these decisions were made. Um, and of course, there is, there, is, there is always a tension between, um, I mean, we're talking about vaccines as a, a, pub, a tool for public health, if you like, but um, the only people who can make the things in bulk are the uh, are large pharmaceutical companies. And yeah, the issue seems things. to have been, but the yeah. um, the documents they released was some were heavily redacted. Mm. There were text messages that were withheld, and that when you see that happening in a governmental body, uh, you know the alarm bells start to go off. So naturally they're going to be yeah. some people who want to know what are you holding back and why yeah i mean as i say i haven't been following that case in detail and unfortunately this sort of thing does seem to happen when effectively we've got governments dealing with corporate entities and suppliers this happens with vaccines as with anything else but the people tend to be a lot, understandably, tend to be a lot more worried about when it's to do with something that's being injected into their healthy bodies than with a lot of other things it happens with. Um, as I, I can't talk about that particular case because I just don't know enough about, don't know, only know basically what you've said. I know there has been controversy. I don't know exactly who said what about who. <laughs> There's other things that people are using to to try to prevent well, COVID in particular, uh, I'm thinking about nitric oxide, like sprayed in the nose. And the other day I was reading that there's some evidence that antihistamines are, are, uh, have a potential to prevent COVID. What about these alternatives? Are, are, uh, I mean, as an immunologist, what do you think of the, the possibility of those things working? Um, 
Well, there is some evidence for um, certain nasal sprays, over-the-counter nasal sprays. Um, there was, in fact, there was a trial that was published a couple of days ago that I have to admit I haven't got around to reading yet. Um, and you know, some of these sprays simply drop the pH of the nose, which makes it less um, healthy environment for the virus. Some of them have other, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a carrageenan spray, which they say sort of traps the virus so it can't infect the cells. I'm not, I have not actually seen an, um, someone producing experimental evidence of that. So I'm not quite sure where that idea of how it works goes. Um, the other favorite one is uh, zinc lozenges. Uh, again, there is there are trials that show that they work. There are also trials that show they don't work. So, um, yeah, there, there is some evidence for some of these alternative approaches. But I, mean, I think when you think about what COVID actually is, or is actually pretty similar to the way a cold works, because I mean, COVID is not the virus itself. COVID is the condition it causes. And most of what that condition is, is when you get a viral infection of the cells in the nose or the throat or whatever, um, the, in the early stages, the immune system responds as if it's just another foreign body, a bit of pollen or something that's got stuck there. Um, it's this persistent irritation. So the immune system um, you know, increases your blood pressure. So it flushes um, fluid out of the blood vessels to flush whatever it is out of there. And it sends in the macrophages and the general inflammatory response to do that. Except, of course, none of that does any good because it's a virus. It's not sitting on the surface where the, immune, the inflammatory response is looking for it. It's inside the cell. And the reason you're feeling really ill is that you've got this persistent virus triggering an inflammatory response that's not doing any good. Um, and if you can use something that will damp down that inflammatory response until the part of your immune system that does clear it out kicks in, well, you're going to feel better. I mean, that's how ibuprofen works fundamentally. Um, so I wouldn't rule out some of these methods, though I would want to see proper experimental data before well, these, are, these are the guys that told me about the nit nitric oxide oxide sprays, the Enovid that I, I and mm. you, there was one trial that looked very promising, but it doesn't seem to have had any follow up. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm not aware. I haven't read the paper, so I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I don't want to say. We talked about we talked about it at the time, but it's a while ago. I think so, and I, I don't. I remember think. I don't remember thinking it was. I don't, I don't, it hasn't made an impression on me anyway. No, but. I think it's interesting though, you know, you've, you've done this book on how vaccines work yeah. and um, now your next book is on, mm. is on colds for which there are yeah. no vaccines and there's no cure and everybody has a favorite home yeah. remedy, but you know, as, as Mark Twain yeah. said once, uh, you know, if, if, if you don't treat a cold, it, it, uh, it, no, what is it? If, if you treat a cold, it, goes away in five days, but if you don't treat it, it hangs on for almost a week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, there are actually vaccines for some colds, but... Uh, oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I mean, influ seasonal influenza, we've mentioned, is... Yeah, I, I don't think a flu is a cold. I guess that's 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 my yeah. limitation. I think, I think there's a vaccine against um, RSV has just been rolled out in the US within the last year, I think it was. Um, RSV being a virus that causes a cold in most people. Um, I, I, never uh, heard of, I never heard of RSV until I started talking about a vaccine for it. And one of my friends said that's because you're not a parent. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's, it's a very, it's the very serious disease is almost exclusively in very young children. Mm -hmm. um, so but old people, when they get it, get pretty sick. So they gave us the RSV vaccine too, because of our age. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the other, the other group. Do you know that, when they're bringing it in in the UK? I don't know. I think it's very new in the US. I would be surprised. I'm, again, I, I'm not up to speed with the discussions to going on about that. I'd be very surprised if there aren't discussions about. Yeah, I, I think there must countries. be. Now, um, is, the, is the RSV vaccine one you can get once or do you have to renew it periodically? Um, well, at the moment, I think as far as I know, they're looking at it as a one shot vaccine. Um, and I mean, really, that's the sort of thing that we probably won't know until it's been in use for a while. Mm. Um, it, we, this does tend to happen with new vaccines is that um, until they've been used on a very large number of people for a decent period of time, we don't really know questions like that. Um, and we don't know the best dose regimes either.
Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've seen, you know, <clears throat> at the beginning of when the when the mRNA vaccines for COVID first yeah. came out, we heard a lot about the, the, this extreme cold chain that they required. Mm. You don't hear about that anymore. It's still an issue. I mean, it did make me laugh at the time because, I mean, there was this discussion about this ultra cold chain that was needed for the, well, particularly the the Pfizer vaccine, um, which was considered to be a major issue. And and what really wasn't registered in the news at the time was that there had been an Ebola outbreak in the um, uh, eastern part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo at the time, which had required vaccines the, the vaccines that are used against that, which also need an ultra cold chain huh. in a region with no electricity. And they were maintaining an ultra cold chain in boats around the tributaries, little wooden boats around the tributaries of the Congo River, getting into villages where they needed to do it. And then suddenly we had everybody here saying, well, we can't maintain an ultra cold chain to a care home in Basingstoke. <laughs> it never really made a lot of sense to me. You know, uh, that, remind, that reminds me that yeah. in the 19... 19- late 80s not early 90s when um <clears throat> when they were talking about aids in africa mm. um the pharma you know a lot of a lot of people tried to s- sell the idea that africans couldn't be given uh the drugs that were being developed because they couldn't tell time or they couldn't you know they couldn't um they wouldn't be able to manage the complexity of the of this the schedule that they had to adhere to and Anthony Fauci went down there and started asking people and everybody talked to, oh, yeah, you, do you know what it's doing? Oh, yeah, my T-cell count is, you know, and they, they knew all the details of their medical condition. He just said, you know, it's utter nonsense. You know, yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was based in the Gambia when they rolled out the, um, they started treating people against HIV there, actually. Um, no, I mean, I think it is, it is worse. I mean, I think, I think the thing that gets missed with that is it probably is true that with at the time the um, um, the dose regimes that were needed for some of the HIV drugs were a lot more complicated than they are now, which was part of it. And um, there was a lot of talk about people in Africa can't manage it. And my feeling about that is often, yeah, that may have been true. Whether the bit that they're getting wrong is that actually nobody is managing these things consistently, and that people in Africa are probably not much worse at it than anybody else. Well, well, Fauci found that, um, you know, they were, they were as competent as anybody, you know, it, it was, it was just one of those prejudices, like, you know, you wouldn't have said that about all of Latin America or all of Europe or anything, but it was somehow because it was Africa, it was like, you know. Yeah, well. It was just, it was a very odd thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there was a lot of, I, I do find a lot of stuff like that, like I say, I, I suspect that nobody was really looking to see how well people in outside Africa were managing these regimes, which I think is uh, another aspect of that prejudice. And then it's assumed that, but. uh, There's been a lot of prejudice about getting medical care and including vaccines to Africa. And Mm. I noticed that they're having a a resurgence of the monkeypox virus. And uh, the main reason being there's a shortage of the vaccine uh, and uh, not not just in uh, in Africa, but in, in in some other developing countries. And why you know, we we have the vaccine? Why is it so hard to get it to those countries? <laughs> um, <laughs> <The> obvious question. <laughs> well, I mean, generally, I would say that vaccination in Africa has been a massive success story. If you if you look at really, there was a, a move to roll out vaccines across, I'd say, the low income parts of the world which are not exclusively in Africa, starting from about 1980. Um, The effect on the infant mortality rate is spectacular. Um, Again, I can't remember the figures, so I I don't want to name, name, give numbers, but we're talking orders of magnitude of children who are just not dying of vaccine preventable diseases. Um, So yeah, I mean, MPOC, MPOC, they've decided it's called now, um, because the WHO, it's just this this slightly irritating thing. WHO say we're not supposed to name um, infectious agents after animals anymore. So they decided it's not called monkeypox, it's called mpox. Or, which or of loca- course or, or locations, I believe. We're not or locations, yeah. But the trouble is that they do think they're terrible at naming things. So of course they then call it mpox, which immediately raises the question, well, why is it called mpox? <laughs> because it used to be called monkey oh, monkeypox. Anyway, um 
Yeah, I mean, the issue there is that, of course, the vaccine that we're talking about is the smallpox vaccine. It was never designed against mpox. It, it's the vaccines against smallpox, which is eradicated 50 years ago, which- And we, it just uh, so happens to work yeah. against mpox. Yeah, because it's a very closely related virus. I mean, well, that's uh, and, like the original. That's like the original vaccine against smallpox, which was actually, which was actually yeah. cowpox. Yes, yes, yeah. I mean, there's a whole host of fairly closely related pox viruses, um, and I think yeah, that is part of the problem. Is that these are vaccines that have been just been kept in storage in case there was an unexpected smallpox outbreak from somewhere. Um, um, instead of having a smallpox outbreak, which we would expect to be pretty much in one place, at least to start with. What's ended up with is a very disseminated mpox outbreak across multiple continents, uh, but fairly thinly spread, which is not really what the current system set up to deal with. And um, I mean, the other thing is the smallpox vaccine is, is um, I mean, it's not a vaccine you want to get unless you really need it. It is, it is one of the ones with the worst, with um, probably more side effects than some of the others. Better or worse than shingles? I always hear the shingles vaccine is really tough. I don't know. I would, I, I, without actually having looked at a direct comparison, I'd rather not say because I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, I hadn't, I hadn't actually heard the shingles vaccine was particularly tough. I, I know several. Well, it's one of those very small samples again. I know several people who say that you know they hadn't had much trouble with other vaccines, but shingles knocked them out for a day. Mm, okay. So yeah. who knows? Wasn't that bad for me? Hmm. Cool. As I recall, I think the only time I ever had a really severe reaction to a vaccine, it was a combination of flu and COVID. Oh, really? Okay. I'm a big yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. I, I got them both at once. Yeah, I am a big fan. I got pretty sick. I, 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 don't, I don't know that I would worry about it now, but, but when I hadn't had a flu shot before, the first time I got a flu shot was in 2020. And um, I did not want to get the flu shot, the pneumonia shot, the COVID shot at the same time, because if one of them went wrong, I wanted to know which one it was. Yeah, I mean, well, actually, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, what what you probably don't want to do with these things is is have them within a short period of time after each other. You're probably better off having them all at once or with a long period of time between them. Yeah, I think I, I think the recommendation was a couple of weeks. So. Mm -hmm. Did something like that. Um, I Isn't there some that. talk of combining those two? Yeah, I've he I've heard that. I don't know where things are with it at the moment. Um, I should say that I spent most of my time sitting at, in front of a screen reading papers. So stuff that's happening right on the cutting edge, I'm not too up to speed with. Um, I, I certainly have heard discussions of combining flu and COVID shots, though, which would, I mean, effectively, it mean you just get one injection instead of two. Yeah, if you watch uh, television in this country, we are inundated by pharmaceutical company ads for mm. all of their products, all of their vaccines and cures and uh, supposed cures for whatever. And they always will state uh, the uh, the main uh, side effects. And mm. then you have at the bottom of the screen tiny, tiny writing with a whole lot more of them. Is there ever going to be any way that pharmaceutical companies can be required to be more transparent than that? I mean, you can't read those side effects, but if you need to get that medicine, medication, it's really important that you know it. And a lot of doctors really don't let you know all of the side effects. Well, I mean, of course, you can always Google it because any medication comes with a package insert. The package insert will list the um, side effects and the PDF of that package insert is always going to be available online. Um, the, I'd, I'd say there's actually a, a, almost a flip side to that, which is that they will list any... Well, OK, when we're doing clinical trials, we don't talk about side effects. We talk about adverse events, which is anything bad that has happened to somebody in that trial while they're in the trial and because generally we don't know who's had the vaccine and who's had the placebo that includes all the ones that have happened to somebody who had the placebo um and so it in practice what happens is every adverse event registered on the people who had the vaccine goes in the package insert um 
so a lot of the time it's going to be yeah i had a bit of a headache when, <laughs> stuff like that and i mean if you look at the package insert for um basic over-the-counter medicine or paracetamol or ibuprofen or something look at the list of adverse events you see on that <laughs> it's it's well, a physician uh, once told me not to read the package inserts he said don't read that stuff yeah um <laughs> i think i think i think informed i think there's something to be said for informed reading put it that way but i mean just be aware that the the list of side effect or adverse events is everything that has ever been registered for somebody who has had that medication which may or may not have something to do with the medication um i i always like to look up if somebody prescribes something, I always want to know what it is and, and what people have reported it doing. And, you know, you know, and, and there are things where a doctor in one place may not always know the interactions and stuff. A friend of mine who lives in Pennsylvania went, went on a trip to India and she was on some medication for acid reflux. And then the doctor gave her anti-malaria medication and she got sick on the plane going to India. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the Indian doctor looked at what she was taking and immediately said, oh, yeah, those two do that. You should be mm -hmm. on this other anti-malaria medication instead. And the point was that the doctor in Pennsylvania just didn't know stuff like that. But the doctor yeah. in India did because he was surrounded by the experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it, that should be known interactions should be uh, easy enough to find. I mean, if you again, you just Google a drug and known interactions, you'll find it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned that you were a researcher in Gambia. Um, I don't want to say what was that like, because that's kind of a fascist <laughs> question. But I mean, what do you think? Did you Are there things you learned from that experience that made it sort of uniquely valuable, do you think? Well, I learned an enormous amount. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, part of the point of being a researcher is to learn things. So, so I would have been doing it wrong if I hadn't. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's I, mean, I, I suppose you're asking, did I learn things that I wouldn't have learned if I hadn't gone to the Gambia, if I'd stayed in a British university? Well, yes, yeah. certainly. I mean, I think uh, there's a, um, you see the connection. Well, you see how, how, you just see how things work in that particular environment uh, much more closely. And I was able to go to the, um, we were working with a, um, a, a clinic in, um, um, a place called Sakuta, which is a, a fairly small, well, they call it a peri-urban area, which is very strange classifications you get. It's sort of not quite rural, but not quite urban either. Um, and so I'd be down there once a week and just really seeing how medicine act is in practice. Is I'm not sure I'm really answering the question there. But, uh, well, I mean... You know, I think I don't. I've certainly never been anywhere in Africa. I don't know if John or Scoop has. And you, and we were talking about the prejudices that people applied, kind of assuming that it's you know going to be way behind the times and stuff. But how did you know? I guess I'm asking how you found it. You know, what was it really like? Um. Yeah. So sort of where to start with that question? Uh, I think. Well, I mean, the Gambia is on any index or any development index, the Gambia is near the bottom. Um, so the, the uh, clinic we were working with was pretty um, basic and it, it was remarkable what the people working there could do with very little um, equipment and, or training. I mean, it always struck me that this, well, one of the major things they were doing there was um, uh, obstetrics, effectively looking after women who were giving birth because that's an extremely dangerous thing to do under any circumstances. It's kind of unavoidable. I mean, it kind of happens everywhere. Well, yes, but uh, and it is actually one of the major causes of uh, female mortality around the world and particularly in low income countries. And I remember thinking at one point that, um, I don't know if you know, if I mentioned Mary Wollstonecroft, the author of the rights of women um, back in the, well, she would have written that about 1800, I forget the exact date. And of course she died because um, uh, there was a part of the placenta was stuck in her uterus and became infected and she became septic. And with the best uh, medicine available anywhere in the world, because she was from a well-to-do family, did not know on earth to do about that. And there I was in this clinic in Sakuta where they didn't have electricity half the time, um, run by three, um, 
women. I think one was a qualified midwife, the other had proper nursing qualification, the other had nursing qualifications, but they wouldn't have lost anybody to that. They would have known exactly how to deal with that. That's interesting. Um, of course, it's, and, you know, it's a different time. It's about 200 years apart, but it does give a sense of how far we've come. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah actually, I'm, I'm, actually, the I remember, um, I think it was Ebola. Mm. There was an Ebola outbreak in Liberia, and mm. some of the public health people wrote to the New York Times about that they that it, they were slow to recognize that it was Ebola because the literature that they had access to insisted that there were no cases of Ebola, that there was no Ebola in Liberia. I think that was the story, and it turned out that there actually were records of it. It's just mm. that it was behind a paywall in one of the very expensive journals they couldn't afford to consult. Oh uh, yeah, that's a and whole so other set of, of issues. You know, yeah. So they were they were writing an argument about why you know the people who, people who were studied for these journals yeah. needed to have access to the results. Yeah, this is an you know, ongoing argument yeah. about um, academic uh, publishing being. Can I use the word scam? <laughs> yeah, well, they're double dipping. In, yeah, in academic journals, but this is more like colonial exploitation, where you know you go and study a disease in in mm. some country, and then you publish it in such a way that they can't ever access the results of their the the, the data they produced. Yeah. Um... I think um, I, I do still fundamentally blame the academic publishing system for that sort of thing, which yeah. effectively puts up these huge pay barriers. Um, I think we've got Robert Maxwell to thank for that, haven't we? Um, yeah, well, I think we have, th we have him to thank for raiding, raiding the journalists' pension funds on the papers that yeah. he owned in Britain. We have him to thank for Ghislaine Maxwell, who is his daughter. <laughs> Well, we have him to thank for buying up Pergamon Press, which is one of the main academic publishers and working out ways to squeeze as much profit out of it as possible, which really, I think, started academic publishing on the track it's gone down. So that's another thing we can blame him for. What a charming guy. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're getting close to the end of our hour and we're getting a lot of uh, new COVID infections uh, mm -hmm in this country uh, and in Texas here uh, yeah. from the latest variant. During the, the worst part of COVID, everyone had ways of protecting themselves. What are the realistic ways that people should know about or protecting from any new uh, uh, variants of uh, COVID? Well, you know, um, masking and such. Yeah, I mean, I think, Obviously, when there is when there is a high amount, a large amount of COVID around, just minimise indoor public spaces, which is easy to say, much harder to do for most people because you've got to go to work, you've got to go to school, and so on. Um, I mean, I use a respirator mask when I when I am in an indoor public space, which is um, well, here we call them FFP2. I think in America it's N95. It's basically the same thing. Um, well, one, problem they, one problem they have is they have the opposite problem to us. We go outside and we're cold. They go outside and they're dying of the heat. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I kind of I kind of assume one of the things that I got very early in the pandemic was a portable HEPA filter fan mm. device because I thought if it made the difference between being able to invite someone over and not, it was worth it. Yeah, but um, the other thing is, it, of course, if it's that well. I was going to say this is probably British thinking rather than Texas thinking. Of course, if it's warm here, we open the windows, which means good ventilation, which is quite an important. Not point. when it's obviously in, <laughs> in Texas, you close all the windows and turn the air conditioning on. So that's probably the opposite set of issues. Um, yeah, but I think ventilation is is part of that. And um, well, I think it's unfortunate that there isn't more of a push to get proper mechanical ventilation in indoor public spaces at the moment. I mean, because the uh, well. It is quite striking if you look at the levels of carbon dioxide, purely the levels of carbon dioxide that are uh, um, recorded from a lot of school classrooms, you're actually looking at levels that are high enough to induce cognitive impairment. So how on earth kids are supposed to be learning anything when they haven't got up when they're <laughs> breathing that level of oxygen, I don't know. And that's before you even start considering how many um, viruses get passed around school classrooms. Um, but it is something that if anyone can do something about it, great. Um, I think um, 
I think, well, the hand hygiene, wash your hands and so on, it gets overstated, but I mean, it's it's not going to do any harm. Um, unfortunately, it tends to get plugged as a bit of a panacea, um, which it shouldn't be because most of the virus that we're going to get infected with is in the air, um, not on the surfaces. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, yeah, I remember uh, wash, washing groceries. We would buy groceries yeah. and wash wash the groceries in early Which, COVID days. Yeah, well, I mean, the, in the early days when we didn't really know how the main methods of transmission were and we had no vaccines and no protection, then, yeah, I mean, I think we need to take every every possible precaution we could. I'm embarrassed uh, to say that I microwaved a mail at first. Until I, <laughs> that was really I, dumb. I never did anything. How, how did it taste? It, <laughs> it, 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 I, I didn't try tasting it, but it made for some crispy uh, correspondence. Uh, yeah, I, well, never did, I never did any of these things. I, I did wash my hands a little more at the beginning, you know, particularly if I was going to visit somebody, one of my friends who had a very elderly husband. But, you know, I, I could not believe that touching your vegetables was going to be that kind of issue. I just couldn't. Well, I mean, actually, if we were dealing with rhinovirus, which is probably the cause of the most cold viruses, it could conceivably be um, because it's a much more resilient Virus well, no, it's, it's more if you touch the packaging or something and then it can last on your hands for quite a long time. Uh, well, that's the other yeah. thing is because I buy yeah. so much stuff at the shop around the corner that doesn't really have packaging, you know, I mean, that was that was the one, you know, small shops were a great blessing at the time because the fruit and vegetables are outside in front. So yeah, you don't, have to, you don't have to go inside only long enough to to pay, you don't you're not sort of in there for half an hour trying to trying to find things so anyway we have we have actually reached the end of our hour and this has been such a great conversation oh thank you thanks for inviting me yeah david thanks so much for coming um and maybe we can do it again sometime there's probably a lot more to talk about where an hour never seems to be enough but we always try to limit ourselves to just the hour. <laughs> oh, definitely. Uh, I'm susceptible to cold, so I'm, I can't wait to hear your next book. I just need to write it. But yeah, I got a feeling that vaccines is a subject that somehow is always current. So I'm sure there's more to say about that. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, well thanks thank you so much. much. Thank you. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.